Hello everyone, welcome to another Pokemon Bible study and movie review in Shady Oak Ministries. I'm of course Shady Oak, and today we're going to be discussing the 11th movie of the Pokemon franchise, the ones that we'll be discussing in this channel, Giratina and the Sky Warrior. Now, under no uncertain terms, I think that everyone in existence could relate and understand the comparisons between Giratina being based on Satan, the six rib horns, the six spikes on the wings, six stripes, everything. The, all of the symbolism and parallels, even the international Pokedex online on the Pokemon official website describes it as the Satan of the Pokemon world. But knowing that there is a growing aura of biblical illiteracy in our culture today, I think it's important to recognize and refresh our memories as far as what the Bible says about Satan, since it's the only dependable source that we have on his origins, purposes, and capabilities, as well as what its name means. So to start this study, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. We're given an insight during the last times. This is a day yet in the future as well as an eternally significant event in which has resulted in implications that will take place then as well, which we'll talk about when we discuss eschatology, the study of the end times. But all of these things then being pointed out and thrown to the side is just seminary banter. I'd like you to read this along with me so you get a proper understanding of who Satan is, where he is in comparison to spiritual implications and authorities, and why we don't have reason to fear him. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer, implying they had a place in heaven before. So the great dragon was cast out. Who's the dragon? That serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and those who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, for he knows that he has a short time. Now, we're going to be discussing five things about Satan to give us an understanding of who he is, not to bring the spotlight onto him, but rather shine the light on him so that he cannot give us the illusion that he's greater than he is. We're going to discuss what Satan, 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 Satan's name means, being associated with the accuser, the serpent, the dragon, from what we've read from these verses. We're going to discuss Satan's methods, his deceptive tendencies, his role as the accuser before God, and getting people to love their lives to the death, what that means. We're going to discuss his current location in heaven and earth, able to pass between the two as he pleases. Satan's reality, that he has a short time, and that most of all, Satan's weakness being the word of God, which we're going to be discussing here right now. Now, all these things are going to be illustrated by Giratina, who will be the primary focus of this study. I know Shaman had a role in this as well. We'll get to her at the end, so patience. First thing we're going to discuss is Satan's name. Now, Satan is devil in Latin, diabolos, which means literally accuser. Satan's name is that same thing in Hebrew. It just means accuser. That's what his name means. That's his shtick. He was originally named Lucifer, which is a name meaning son of the morning. In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, as well as in a passage in Ezekiel, I believe it was chapter 34, but I can't be certain. 24, I believe it was. Yes. Satan was originally a cherub. An anointed cherub, a very special angel who was, for all intents and purposes, a worship leader in heaven. A super angel that was given free will, just like all of God's creation has, to personally choose his own heart and, well, where his heart belonged and chose with that free will to make himself think that he was greater than God. Now, before this, he was not unlike, or if not an equal to, Michael or Gabriel, who were also angels, just angels. 
The illustration that we see in this is clear enough from Giratina's Pokemon description in Pokemon Platinum. It was banished for its violence, and it silently gazed upon the old world from the distortion world, his dwelling place. Now, understand this is unknown certain terms pointing out the Dante's Inferno, you know, Allegheny Divine Comedy kind of deal. Satan is not in hell right now. Hell is not open for business. He's not even in the abyss. That won't even be till Revelation 20. And Satan is currently has residency in heaven, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But understand, where Satan is perspective-wise right now is just simply in a state where he is wallowing in his own ego and facing the consequences thereof in that it puts him at natural enmity against God, which is why we get into his methods. Satan's methods are to deceive, which is literally defined as to conceal or misrepresent the truth. Now, the word accuser, going along with Satan's name, along with deception, an accusation doesn't always have to be a lie. It can be in some cases, especially if a lawyer's doing it, but I'm tink. But <laughs> to accuse just means to represent the truth in a way that it harms the relationship between one individual and another. For example, a legal term. If I'm going to accuse someone for a crime against the state, I am creating a guilt that would then cause the judge to convict the person of the crime if found guilty and then they would have due punishment put on them. I'm causing a rift in a relationship, so to speak, by being an accuser. That's just as a human trait, let alone an angelic one. And understand, Satan's goal is to affect your relationship with God. And by this produces what we know as death. And death, simply put, is the separation of our consciousnesses from our bodies. To separate our spirit from God, that's spiritual death, the absence of life. If God's the source of all life, then naturally, just like separation from heat is cold, separation from light is darkness, then philosophically, factually, all Satan wants to do is to separate you from God, and thus, by definition, cut you off from your source of life, or to kill you. All of these efforts are both immediate, temporal, and eternal. Now, he does these through many ways. We have deception, which is to simply point out, like we've mentioned, that God doesn't exist, doesn't care, or doesn't want you with him. And note, that is under the category of deception. These are all false misrepresentations of the truth. A second example or opportunity Satan uses to separate you, affect your relationship with God, is accusation. He makes you feel that your sins are too much for God to forgive. That is, representing the truth but in a way that is damaging to your relationship with you. It's completely ignoring the fact that Jesus has paid for that distance between you. But when Satan comes to us and says, yeah, you suck and stuff, he has a point. If it wasn't for Jesus, the problem is, by deception, he tries to keep us as far away from that means of redemption as possible. And lastly, of course, understanding to keep us away from the solution would be defined as distraction. That just like Satan uses deception, he misrepresents the truth, he makes us misunderstand who God is so we never come to him and understand he wanted the relationship with us in the first place. He enjoys accusation, to making our sin seem bigger than God's grace, but most of all he loves distraction in making other things matter more to us than the most important thing, even using good things to distract us from the best things. To make the things in this current life seem more important than the one thing that will get us into the next life and to hold that off with these sets of priorities until it is too late. So on technicality, weaseling his way to drag us down to hell with him. Now, according to the Bible, these accusations take place before the throne of God. And only at a certain time will Satan actually be cast out and kept from re-entering heaven. This will be in the, during the Great Tribulation. But luckily, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 through 2 tells us the solution is already existent even now. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. That's the ideal. And if anyone sins, next verse, it just says, let's be honest. If anyone sins, we don't have an accuser, but an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So note, Jesus is the opposite of Satan in attitude towards us, not in power and authority. 
Jesus is God. Lucifer is just an angel. Understand the difference. Now, his current location, I've mentioned several times before already, he is located in heaven where he performs a spiritual role as our accuser, but he also can dwell on earth. Note, he is not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at once, but one day he will be trapped here on earth and waiting there for judgment. Now, for all intents and purposes, this is not going to be high on his list of priorities because while we do know from the book of Job that Satan is capable of wandering to and fro throughout the earth, going up and down and so on and so forth, that this isn't the place he wants to be. And that hell certainly is not a place he wants to go either. Separation from God includes every good and perfect gift. In fact, hell exists because Satan wanted an existence separated from God. So God accommodated him and he said, oh, well, I can still do better. Trip on ego. All these things being pointed out then, his current residency is on the earth and he will actually be prevented from keeping us from heaven, or he will be kept from re-entering into heaven. But understand, just like we read in 1 John 2, 1 through 2, that he is that propitiation for our sins. He is our advocate with the Father, and Jesus will still be in heaven advocating for us, which means to stand on our side, to be our defense. And if God is playing goalie and... <laughs> Look at the comparison and power differences. He's at a remarkable disadvantage, which is why he goes to such weasel tactics that he, as he does. Now, recognizing this as well, we understand the illustration was just like Giratina was able to pass through the distortion world and the earth, went beyond his bounds and ended up being trapped in the distortion world. So he wouldn't be a threat to people anymore. Now note, Satan has no power over our bodies but what God gives him, and being cut off from heaven removes his power over us towards our souls. We see the illustration being represented there, the real danger in keeping us from God. And also note the fact, what did the verse say in Revelation 12 that ultimately gives Satan just that vein in his forehead as the fact that he knows that he's got to make the most is because he has a short time. Who banished him to the distortion world again? Dialga. I liked how they did that. Now, Revelation 20 verses 1 through 3 and 2 Peter 2, 4, they emphasize an abyss, a bottomless pit that separates angels from us when they get too violent or dangerous. And as far as that goes in the spiritual realm, that's just where we have mention of it. There's also a mention of it in the Gospel of Luke referring to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, which for all intents and purposes, wasn't a parable. It was an insight into the afterlife before Jesus came to die for sinners. But also understand the emphasis to all of these points. What is the real focus being brought to? It's that Satan is at a disadvantage. That the only way that he can keep us from God is to take advantage of our free will, not to ultimately let, allow us to understand what's actually happening. That even though Satan will one day be bound, the only reason why he's still here today is because God has a purpose for him. And what is that? It's that love requires a second option. That if free will could not be practiced in any other choice but the one presented to us, that's not free will. That's function. That's literally what this computer is doing right now. I push button, it has no choice but to submit to the only option, the only charge in which the motherboard's going to connect that function to that purpose through the keyboard. It's going to do the thing that I intended it to do because it has no other option. It has no other purpose or understanding of an alternative. If it did, I'd have a virus and I'd replace it. But God has made us free moral agents and by allowing Satan to exist, he in a sense represents the heart and character of someone who instead of wanting to make you have life and have it more abundantly, who only wants to steal, kill, and destroy from you. But he'll give you gifts. He'll, he'll give you presents up front if it means ultimately making you deviate from the best thing for you. He'll give you what's good, what, what fits your fancy in the moment, which is also goes into his methods of distraction and deception. But understand, his name means accuser because that's all he really wants to do is to separate us from our relationship with God. But that distance has been closed by Jesus. And again, I'll read that verse to you again. We have an advocate with the Father. That if anyone sins, that when 
to be, speak realistically. Anyone sins, no matter what accusation Satan brings before you, Jesus is already there at the throne of the Father saying, I died for that soul. And the only one who can decide whether or not he stands for your case or not is you. Understand that. Satan's reality. We know his location. We know his methods. We know his identity, his name. But what is his reality? What does he know? He has a short time. Understand that Satan is an angel, not an anti-god. He's a being created with an eternal existence, just like we are. But the problem is because he's chosen rebellion against God, God is willing to respect his choice and has created hell as an alternative to him. Well, with an existence without God, that is what hell is. It's not open for business yet, and until after the tribulation and the thousand-year reign of Christ, Revelation chapter 20, we know that his time is limited and that he is not happy about it. And that's why he's trying to drag as many people down with him as he can. It's classic supervillain mentality. If you can't go after Superman, you'll target Lois Lane and his mom. It's just how that works. He can't go after God, so he goes after those he loves most. And that's what the rest of Revelation 12 discusses. Satan's persecution of the Jewish people and the Christians. No idea seen in illustration in this world today. And just a side note, if you hate Israel, understand that is inspired by Satan and you need to repent. But also consider the fact that because God has a plan and a purpose for Satan, that he allows him to exist, we need to understand and trust God that Satan's existence serves an actual purpose, an actual beneficial one. Just like First Peter says, this tests our souls, proves the sincerity of our faith. It also allows us to see how eager the world is to follow Satan's example. That we having a fallen sinful nature want an existence without God, without even knowing the consequences. So God allows us to see who exactly we're getting mixed up with. And if we want to stay, we want to deal with the abusive partner, God will let you make your own decisions. But that's not a decision he would want for you. And he's given you every alternative from that option. So, naturally illustrated, Dialga, he has a short time. He knows his days are limited and that even though he is an eternal being, he will one day be cast into hell and will be done with him forever. But until that time, he serves a purpose. And until that time, Dialga is keeping a, lot, a watchful eye on him. And he knows this. His days are numbered on a stopwatch. He's not going to be allowed to do anything more than what God allows him to do. And that means that if a good God is allowing Satan to do the awful things he does, then God has a plan to even use Satan's evil for our benefit and strengthening. And this is where we bring ourselves to the last and most important point, Satan's weakness, how to confront him. And no, it's not fairy type, although that's funny. Satan's weakness is the word of God. And understand what I mean by that, that despite appearances, Satan is all talk because the only thing that he can do effectively to us is lie, accuse, and distract. Note, he's an angel of great power, and he is certainly capable of much more, but the only thing that can really affect us at a real significant level isn't the destruction of these bodies. In fact, if he does that, if he does that he's done us the greatest favor we could ever ask, because he's removed a barrier that has been put in place that keeps us from fellowship with the Father which is why he tries to drag this on as long as possible. So the principal solutions in overcoming him, if his methods, his motives, and his means in keeping us from God are accusations, lies, and distractions, then the natural solutions are truth, the reality and understanding of what our relationship with God is, and to focus on what really matters. And what would that be? Well, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. People aren't your enemy. Understand that. But against principalities, it's a name for spiritual creatures, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So what does this armor of God look like? 
is it like you know some spiritual battle thing like I just you know close my eyes and meditate and I'm in like in the distortion world with this lightning suit and stuff and I'm duking it out with Satan no trust me Satan can't take God in a fair fight but he can certainly take you understand how these aspects of real warfare how to confront and defeat Satan are described stand therefore having girded your waist with a belt with truth truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness your right relationship with God having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all okay what do we need more than anything else take the shield of faith an understanding of who God is and trusting that he means what he said with it, you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. And how do we swing our sword to quote Tobuscus? Praying always with all prayer and all supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication of the saints. So understand, let's go through these armor aspects again. What keep? What is a belt meant to do? In Roman days, it kept all of our armor in place. What keeps our spiritual reality safe? Truth as our foundation to answer Satan's lies. What keeps us shielded, trusting in God and knowing that he has a purpose for everything, that even though we're being shot, he's got us covered. Helmet, what keeps our brain intact, the most important aspect about us, that we've been saved, that we have an advocate with the Father. How do we fight back? Not with our swords, but with the word of God saying, Satan, you cannot change. And note, I discourage any conversation with Satan whatsoever. But understand, the more you focus on him, the more he's got you. But understand, any answer to Satan should always be the way that Jesus did, referencing God's word. Throw yourself down. Angels will catch you. It is written, you shall not tempt the, word, the Lord your God. I'm not here to put on a show for him. He, I'm here to serve him. He'll take care of me as I'm serving him. Tell that stone to make bread. Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I don't need that right now. I have him. All these I will give to you. All you need to do is bow down and worship me. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. No, Jesus didn't even go on to explain it like I did. He just kind of just blurted out quote passages from Deuteronomy. But understanding what they meant, Satan had no response to it. Because light can't or darkness can't resist or fight back against light. Once it's there, darkness is gone as long as the light's able to reach it. And the more power you're able to influence it with, the more influence that light is able to be. That's why you want to have multiple lights in the room. So you can see this. Now, <laughs> so that point being made, how do we overcome Satan? By sending God to deal with him. When Satan knocks on your door, send Jesus to answer it. We cannot take on a dragon. That's, that's pretty fair visual, right? But we can escape him by remembering who can save us from his power. That just like Satan isn't afraid of us, in fact, he's all too eager to wipe the floor with us. But who has already crushed that snake's head? It's Jesus. He can't stand against Jesus' truth. That's just a spiritual reality he has no answer to, and he can't. So understand, if you can't ignore Satan's lies, and in reality, most of the time we can't, and you can't ignore Satan's accusations, and you can't always reject what he's going to bring up. But understand, Jesus can. When Satan accuses you, Jesus is your defense. When Satan lies to you, Jesus is the truth. And most of all, when Satan tries to distract you, Jesus should always be your focus. And understand, any distraction, if your focus isn't on the Lord, then it's on him. It's where he wants you to be, anywhere, but where he can't get to you. And that's the whole point, because here's the thing. If we can't take on this dragon. We need to start and end in the same place where it always has worked before. 
And if we understand that we aren't perfect, but we are forgiven, that's the foundation of what this armor is all about. If we go back to the simple things, go back to the beginning, remember the meadow that brought us to heaven. Like a certain little chinchilla, <laughs> for all intents and purposes. Because let's be honest, how is Shaman illustrated if she represents us in the spiritual battle? Kind of a jerk. There's really no other way to mince corners on that. But Shaman, understand, she couldn't fight Giratina. Only irritate, distract, or at best avoid him. And how? By going back to the garden. Remembering her origins. And most of all, by only using the power that gave her the ability to enter heaven, i.e. to fly at all. So, the five things we can take away from this, here they are. Satan is an angel, not God. Satan is in heaven, but he won't be there forever. He won't be anywhere forever, for that matter. We have an advocate. Every time Satan is going to try and accuse you, Jesus is going to have the answer. If you don't turn to him, he can't help you. That's Satan's whole point. He wants to distract you, to keep you from Jesus. The only way to overcome Satan is to go back to the garden. Remember our first love. The one that we've been separated from, we have been joined. And lastly, the fifth, that answer is always going to come from Jesus. Power alone belongs to him. You can't take Satan, but Jesus has already taken him. Because as I recall the prophecy, it's Jesus, the first prophecy in the book of Genesis chapter 3, uh, from your seed shall strike his heel, but he shall crush the serpent's head. There's only one business end of a snake. And the only power that Satan had over us is death. And if by the cross of Christ, we have the promise and the reality of resurrection, then what more can he do to us? Kill our body? Hey, don't fear him who can kill the body. Fear him who can, after your body, kill your soul. And guess what? As I recall, he didn't kill your soul. He did everything he could to save it. That's the solution, how we confront the enemy. And understand, it's not about telling Satan off. Frankly, I think that's the stupidest thing you could ever do in your prayer time, is to spend it talking to Satan instead of Jesus. Focus on him. And understand, the less you have to do with the enemy, the better. Because they are the soldiers. We're the civilians. All we need to do is keep our bulletproof vest on and make sure we don't, don't get caught in the crossfire. Because he will go after innocence. But the best thing that we can do is not only call on help when we need it, but most of all, stay armored because you don't know when the enemy is going to want to come after you. That's the point. If any of this has been of help to you, I thank you taking the time to listen to it. If you'd like questions or would like to know more about the topics we've discussed, leave them in the comments below. If they are sincere, I'd be happy to answer them. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, you know where to go. But most importantly, if you know someone who perhaps isn't aware of these approaching tactics, who has been a victim of the enemy schemes for a long time now, or perhaps has even just seen this movie but isn't familiar with its messages, if you'd like them to see this from the biblical perspective, please share this study with anyone and everyone you feel would be blessed by it. Thank you for your time and listening to the study, and remember, focus on Jesus.